Hey, what is good, YouTube? This is Who Was Like God, and welcome to my study of Leviticus. I got one special person in mind for this study, who is my abuela, my abuelita. But I pray this can be a blessing to all of y'all, because there is value in studying the law of God and the scriptures of God, even in times or covenants that precede us now. So we're just going to dive right in. But before we start with the book of Leviticus, the reason I'm starting here is because a lot of people... I have a general gist of uh, Genesis and Exodus. But after that, when you get to Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, it's a lot of commandments and a lot of specific things that people sort of gloss over um, because it seems very repetitive or because it's a lot of names back to back to back. So I'm actually going to go through these things and give a sort of summary about what's going on in Leviticus and a summary of Genesis and Exodus. I would love to get to a point to study these things in depth. That that's where my heart is. But what I'm doing here is just reading the reading this uh, chapter by chapter, giving a general summary and talking about how it connects to other passages to to get get us a better understanding of of the Old Testament and how it relates to Christ and the New Testament. All right. So in the book of Genesis, we get the idea of where God makes the world. He sets the cosmos in order. He's dealing with humanity in general. But humanity keeps rebelling against God, so then he decides to just use the people of Israel. And God plans that Israel, the Hebrews, would be a blessing to the other nations. All right, I have a I have a Genesis rebellion uh, Genesis rebellion series where we talk about how in three different places we can see where the humans and the evil spirits start rebelling against God, and it's after that point of the Tower of Babel that God actually decides to use the family of Abraham. By the end of Genesis, we have Joseph, and the exaltation of Joseph causes the Hebrews to sort of move and settle in Egypt, and then they actually live in Egypt for a time. But then when a new Pharaoh comes, then they start getting enslaved, and that gets us to the book of Exodus. So God chooses Israel, they go to uh, Egypt, um, they're there for hundreds of years, and they're actually under harsh treatment, and eventually God saves his people from Egypt through Moses and Aaron, and brings them on this journey to the promised land. In the second half of the book of Exodus is all of those commandments which are the terms of that covenant between God and his people, the letter of the law given to a specific people. And Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy are sort of a continuation of that with all these commandments uh, 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 in terms of the covenant between God and his people as he's bringing them into the promised land. All right, so there's a lot of interesting things we could study. And we're going to start with Leviticus chapter 1, the first five to six chapters are actually different regulations for the different types of offerings that the children of Israel would bring to God. So Leviticus, Leviticus chapter one, the Lord called Moses and spoke to him from the tent of meeting saying, speak to the people of Israel and say to them, when any one of you brings an offering to the Lord, you shall bring your offering of livestock from the herd or from the flock. If his offering is a burnt offering from the herd, he shall offer a meal without blemish. He shall bring it to the entrance of the tent of meeting, that he may be accepted before the Lord. He shall lay his hand on the head of the burnt offering, and it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him. Then he shall kill the bull before the Lord, and Aaron's sons the priests shall bring the blood and throw the blood against the sides of the altar that is at the entrance of the tent of meeting. Then he shall flay the burnt offering and cut it into pieces, and the sons of Aaron the priests shall put fire on the altar and arrange wood on the fire. And Aaron's sons the priests shall arrange the pieces, the head and the fat, on the wood that is on fire on the altar, but his entrails and its legs he shall wash with water. And the priests shall burn all of it on the altar as a burnt offering, a food offering with a pleasing aroma to the Lord. This is given... Uh, the different rules for the burnt offerings about how you would bring it to the priests and they would burn some of it and um, throw blood onto the sides of the altar and how that they would burn the pieces, the head and the fat, but the entrails and legs would be washed with water. So the pieces, the head and the fat would be burned on the offering, but the entrails like the insides and the legs would be cleansed and washed out. So they wouldn't burn the whole animal. But this is a regulation of how when you bring the animal, how the priests uh, of the Israelites would move in order to make a sacrifice. If his gift for a burnt offering is from the flock, from the sheep or goats, he shall bring a male without blemish and he shall kill it on the north side of the altar before the Lord. 
and Aaron's sons the priest shall throw its blood against the sides of the altar. And he shall cut it into pieces with his head and his fat, and the priest shall arrange them on the wood that is on the fire on the altar, but the entrails on the legs he shall wash with water. Again, when you're offering the sacrifice, the priest wouldn't use the whole animal. They would use some of the animal, but the entrails on the legs they would wash and they wouldn't uh, burn on the altar and um, get consumed in fire. And the priest shall offer all of it and burn on the altar. It is a burnt offering, a food offering with a pleasing aroma to the Lord. So it talks about how these offerings are pleasing aroma to the Lord. And that basically means that the Lord is accepting it. It's, it's giving this, it's almost as if it's giving this pleasant smell before the Most High, which is reflecting the fact that if you follow it the way the Lord has said, he's going to accept the offering. If his offering to the Lord is a burnt offering of birds, then he shall bring his offering of turtle doves or pigeons. And the priest shall bring it to the altar and wring off its head and burn it on the altar. Its blood shall be drained on the, out on the side of the altar. He shall remove its crop with its contents and cast it besides the altar on the east side in the place for ashes. He shall tear it open by its wings, but shall not sever it completely. And the priest shall burn it on the altar, on the wood that is on the fire. It is a burnt offering, a food offering with a pleasing aroma to the Lord. So all of that were basic parameters for the laws regarding burnt offerings. Understand the children of Israel now being brought to the promised land and God is giving them commandments about how to properly sacrifice to God, right? Because they were acquainted with all these other gods in Egypt. Now they're being told to worship this God that they're supposed to have no other God before, right? The first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. So now they're only supposed to worship this God and God is giving them the instructions about how to sacrifice to him rightly. I understand this is before Christ, who was the Messiah and the ultimate sacrifice. This was even before the time of the prophets, where we can get them making prophecies about what the Messiah would ultimately do um, and what was predicted of him. And even if you don't want to say Messiah, the person from Israel is predicted to do these things that Christ fulfilled. This was before Christ and before the prophets of Israel, even um, when God is originally giving these instructions to the house of Israel. So understand the time we're talking about. It's way, way, way back in the day. And God is telling them how to make sacrifices to him rightly. I'm going to read one more chapter, which is the laws of grain offerings. So in the first chapter, we talked about the laws for burnt offerings here. We're talking about people who offer grain to God as a sacrifice, as an honoring, as an offering. Here are the rules about that. When anyone brings a grain offering as an offering to the Lord, his offering shall be a fine flour. He shall pour oil on it and put frankincense on it and bring it to Aaron's sons, the priests. And he shall take from it a handful of the fine flour and oil with all of its frankincense. And the priest shall burn this as its memorial portion on the altar a food offering with a pleasing aroma to the Lord. But the rest of the grain offering shall be for Aaron and his sons. It is the most holy part of the Lord's food offerings. Now this part is really interesting, but basically the priests are holy. Aaron was Moses' brother and his lineage is the high priest of Israel. So the priesthood, they would offer when you're giving a grain offering with the oil and the frankincense, you would offer part of it, but the rest would actually be for the priest to eat. So it's cool how they have this sort of system where they would self-regulate um, how the priests sort of, I don't want to say get compensated, but how the priests sort of uh, um, got, got their due for doing God's work. They would eat some of it, but the rest would go as an offering to God and it would be a pleasing aroma to the Lord. Again, pleasing aroma showing how when you follow the sacrifices the way God tells you to, it's going to be accepted before the Most High. So again, we, when we understand these offerings, it's not the complete thing. If that's any type of takeaway, they would offer some of it and either wash the entrails and the legs if it was a bull or an animal or offer some of the grain and use the rest to eat if it was a grain offering. So there's different types of rules about different uh, offerings, but the idea is they wouldn't offer the whole thing as we can see from these first two chapters. So at verse four, when you bring a grain offering baked in the oven as an offering, it shall be unleavened loaves of fine flour mixed with oil or unleavened wafers smeared with oil. And if your offering is a grain offering baked on a griddle, it shall be a fine flour unleavened mixed with oil. You shall break it in pieces and pour oil on it. 
it is a grain offering. And if your offering is a grain offering cooked in a pan, it shall be made of fine flour with oil. And you shall bring the grain offering that is made of these things to the Lord. And when it is presented to the priest, he shall bring it to the altar. And the priest shall take from the grain offering its memorial portion and burn it on the altar, a food offering with a pleasing aroma to the Lord. But the rest of the grain offering shall be for Aaron and his sons. It is the most holy part of the Lord's food offering. So good. This this word gets a little repetitive. Is a lot of times you'll see in, in, in the Torah and the law, a lot of phrases um, be literally repeated verbatim in different parts. But it's talking about the same thing, the procedures for sacrifice. Okay. Verse 11. No grain offering you shall bring to the Lord shall be made with leaven. For you shall burn no leaven nor any honey as a food offering to the Lord. As an offering of first fruits, you may bring them to the Lord, but they shall not be offered on the altar for a pleasing aroma. So God is basically laying down the law and saying, don't bring me any leaven and don't bring me any uh, any honey. Don't burn any honey. Now, there's one caveat where God says on the offering of first fruits, sure, you can offer me a, a, a leaven, but it won't be on the altar. So no leaven, there's one exception given. And when you do do it, it's not on the altar for a pleasing aroma that we've been reading about. So even then there's this distinction. You shall season it. You shall season all your grain offerings with salt. You shall not let the salt of the covenant with your God be missing from your grain offering. With all of your offerings, you shall offer salt. So here's something where, where the offerings have to be seasoned. I I, I want to make a little cool, uh, colloquial joke here. You know what I'm saying? People of color whether it will be black or Puerto Rican as I am, you know what I'm saying? We always got that seasoning, Goya, Sasson, you know what I'm saying? We never leave stuff unseasoned. I just think that that's kind of neat that it's biblical. In a sense, God wants his offerings to be seasoned with salt because it reminds them of the salt of the covenant, their agreement with the most high. Verse 14, if you offer a grain offering of first fruits to the Lord, you shall offer for the grain offering of your first fruits fresh ears roasted with fire, crushed new grain, and you shall put oil on it and lay frankincense on it. It is a grain offering. And the priest shall burn as its memorial portion some of the crushed grain and some of the oil with this frankincense. It is a food offering to the Lord. Okay, so, so far, the first few chapters of Leviticus, as Israel is getting into the promised land, God gives them the rules about burnt offerings and food offerings, whether you offer animals, be it bulls or doves, or whether you offer grain with frankincense and oil, no leaven. Here's the thing I wanna emphasize is the Bible talks about the letter and the spirit of the law. When we study these things, we can see that these commandments were given to a specific people. Deuteronomy chapter four makes that very clear that these commandments were given to the Israelites. So. The letter of the law, the specific textual commandment was given to this people. But when we understand the spirit of these things, we could see applications that apply to the whole body of Christ, everybody who's been grafted into the family of God because of Jesus. You see what I'm saying? So the spirit where I think we could deduce from these chapters is the level of perfection that reflects the Lord's perfection and holiness in the sense that he didn't want leaven and the animals that would be offered had to be perfect without blemish. We read on the Old Testament and see how when Israel sort of forgot the importance of offering the good animals to God, they were chastised. And that sort of reflects the, the, the holiness of God and just the, 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 the perfection that was needed among the sacrifices for the children of Israel and how, why Jesus himself could only be our sacrifice as the perfect sacrifice. You understand what I'm saying? The Lord in his holiness, by nature of his holiness, has this high standard, which no ordinary person um, could fulfill in terms of bearing the sin of his people and the world for that matter, outside of Christ, who was the son of God, or as John 1 would put it, God in the flesh who tabernacled among us. You get what I'm saying? So when you understand the spirit, there's a level that reflects God's perfection that we can see play out in the New Testament especially with the fact that unleavened bread would sort of become this this this, this, this testimony, this, this this importance of unleavened would be become so important in the history of the saints of God. We, we see it as importance that the Old Testament, we see how Christ used parables where he talks about leaven and the importance of unleavened bread. And we can see how even in the New Testament, how, how in, in 1 Corinthians 5, the Apostle Paul talks about, let us not worship Christ 
Specifically, he talks about the Passover and a spirit of malice and the old leaven, but in a spirit of, of, of love and, and being renewed by Christ. So the importance that God brings up about leaven plays a role throughout the whole rest of the Bible. And this is one of the first places where we can see that actually play out. So this is why it's beautiful to study the scriptures because we can see things that God introduces that play a role, you know, in the whole rest of the Bible. So with that being said, I pray this would be a blessing. Blessing. If y'all have some insights or thoughts, let me know in the comments. Let me know how I did. If you thought this was a good description, if you think I should be more descriptive, or if you think I'm being, you know, what I'm saying like I'm not speaking in a way that's that that's easy to understand. Let me know so I can I can have the right type of thing as I continue this study series to help us better understand the scriptures and understand the law of God. All right. Again, I'm starting here because most people have the idea about Genesis. God created the world. Exodus, they're free from Egypt. Now I want to actually dive into Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The rest of that, because a lot of people don't, don't necessarily understand the gems that are in there uh, as much as Genesis and Exodus. So all that being said, y'all be blessed in God. Y'all be blessed in the Messiah. And I'll see you in the next video. Peace.